Wait, I just have to click on the recording. I, I'm just so sorry I couldn't be there in person to see all of you. So, but you know, hopefully I can I can visit you sometime in the not too distant future. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, everyone see that? Yes? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, I actually decided to change my talk. Uh, it was originally a, a, a more academic title, but when I thought about it, it, it really is about our attention, our devices, and our stress. So I think this captures it much more clearly. So, um, you know, I, as some of you know, I've been looking at how we interact with our personal technologies for many years. And uh, you, many of you might be familiar with this quote from Herb Simon, who says, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently. So in, you know, I've been studying people for a long time and participants frequently complain to me that they feel exhausted, they feel, uh, you know, overwhelmed. And I, you know, certainly just the amount of information at our fingertips contributes to that, you know, absolutely. But it's not just the fact that it's a poverty of information. Uh, sorry, poverty of attention, it's actually how we distribute our attention. So it's not only the fact that we have to, we feel like we have to take in so much information, but it's, the, it's what we do with that information. We shift our attention, we, we break up our tasks, uh, we multitask, we get interrupted, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. So um, some of you, when you think of multitasking, uh, might think of doing two things in parallel. You can if one of the tasks you're doing doesn't require a lot of our attentional resources. So you, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can work on some uh, very difficult material reading and listen to, say, classical music. So as long as one of those activities doesn't require a lot of attentional resources, you can do things at once. But most often what people do when they work on their devices is they shift their attention very rapidly between different screens or between different devices. And this can be triggered by something external to us like a targeted notification, it can be triggered by something internal, like a memory or an urge uh, to do something. So this is uh, what we find to be characteristic of what people usually do day in and day out uh, in, in their waking hours. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with cognitive psychology, I just wanna introduce a very basic idea here. And it's the idea that people have a limited attentional capacity. Now, there have, for over five decades, this has been studied in the laboratory. And people come in, they're given two tasks to work on, so they're shifting their attention rapidly, and then their performance begins to decline. And so it's, it's a theory of limited attentional resources and the theory says that when you use up these resources, your performance declines. Um, I will mention that recently there's a lot of very interesting technologies that are starting to be used to be able to measure cognitive load. Cognitive load is associated with attentional capacity. So a lot of it is, is um, uh, being researched and it's very exciting. But when we talk about our behavior in our day-to-day -day environment, and it's not in a laboratory, uh, when people 
use sustained focus for long periods of time, when they multitask, when they handle interruptions, it uses up attentional resources. And so the theory says that the more your cognitive resources are drained, the worse is your performance, but also interestingly, the less resistant you are to distractions. So if you're just exhausted, you know, you've been working, you haven't had a break, along comes a targeted notification that uh, says something like, test your intelligence. Oh, everybody wants to know how smart they are. So you click on it and you know, you've not been able to resist that distraction or an inner urge to check TikTok or Facebook uh, or your favorite social media. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, studying uh, attention resources has been done for, for decades in laboratories. But because I'm interested in what people do in their day-to-day -day lives, uh, I create what I call living laboratories where I go to where people are. Because in a laboratory, I mean, there's, there's a lot you can do. And I, I do lab studies and it's, it's very valuable, but it's very hard to model things like a person's uh, chronic stress or career trajectory or conflicts they have with colleagues. So there's so much going on in the real world that I think it's better to, if you really want to get a good sense of what's going on, what people are using their technologies, you have to really go to their, uh, their real world environments. So um, over the years, I've, I've used various kinds of uh, methods, which include sensors. So I use, uh, started out a long time ago using uh, stopwatches. People would click on the stopwatch, who would follow people around. Uh, if you're familiar with Frederick Taylor, uh, he was probably the first um, uh, efficiency expert. Frederick Taylor used to use that technique. Uh, but since then, we've we've tried heart rate monitors, and then when new wrist wearables came on the market, we've used that. More recently, uh, thermal imaging. Uh, this, of course, is done in laboratory. Uh, we've used sense cams. Uh, this is to measure face-to-face -face interaction. We log people's digital activity. We um, also log their physical activity measure sleep, and then we get a battery of surveys uh, to measure things like demographics, personality measures. And, and we do experience sampling, uh, also called ecological momentary assessments, to be able to get the person's, the participant's subjective uh, <clears throat> perception of what they're experiencing, like their, their mood or their perception of their attentional state. So let me just start by saying um, that our attention spans have declined over the years when people are working on their screens. So, um, and this is not just my work, but it's also work of other people as well. So we first started measuring this back in 2004, that was using the stopwatches, uh, which you know were quite accurate. And what we're actually measuring is we're measuring people's attention span on a screen before switching. It's not a perfect indicator of uh, people's focus, but it's a good proxy. It's a, it's a reasonable proxy. And um, you know, until some better uh, technologies <clears throat> come along and, and they're starting to, um, this is, uh, a good proxy for now <clears throat> of, uh, of people's attention spans on their devices. So back in 2004, <clears throat> excuse me, we found <clears throat> that people's uh, attention span was about 150 seconds. Then uh, 2012, 75 seconds, um, your Achilles who, works with Byron Reeves at Stanford, 
found 65 cent, uh, seconds. Um, other studies we did, 48, 47, Andres Meyer and colleagues uh, found 50 seconds. And most recently, my uh, student, graduate student Fatima Akbar in her dissertation found 44 seconds. So it seems like we're, we're at the steady state of about 47 seconds of attention before people uh, switch. But it seems to be declining over the years. And, it, and it's short, it's relatively short. So what we have found with interruptions, you <clears throat> probably uh, may know that interruptions can come from some external store, source. Uh, you know, typically notifications or telephone rings, but they can also come from something inside of people. So they can be self-initiated. Uh, could be a, a memory, you know, you remembered you have to do something or you're cued by something on your interface. Um, so there's, you know, or just an inner urge that you just, you just feel you have to go to TikTok because, you know, TikTok is hilarious and you haven't been there for a few hours. So there's a lot of reasons, but roughly um, it's about half and half. Half the times people are interrupted by themselves. So uh, our studies over the years have consistently shown that when people multitask a lot, the faster they shift their attention, the higher is, their, is the measure of their acute stress. Uh, and also the same with interruptions, that uh, interruptions are also associated with stress. Uh, we found this from uh, four studies. Uh, we looked at, um, mo most often we've looked at email as a source of interruptions. And we find that, um, you know, we, in one study in 2011, we cut off the email for a full week. Uh, and in comparing that week with the previous week where they had email, we saw stress was significantly lower. Uh, we do find that the more uh, email, the more hours on email, the higher the stress. Uh, and uh, we've also found that just simply uh, the number of times shifting attention uh, is associated with stress. And this is also found with laboratory studies where um, people have been given these kinds of dual tasks, shifting attention, and uh, one study finds decreased secretion of immu immunoglobulin A reactivity, another finds higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure when people are switching their attention rapidly. So let me talk about a study we did using thermal imaging to measure stress. Now this is a laboratory study because uh, thermal imaging cameras, they're, they're stationary and uh, you know, people have to sit in front of them. Now, they can pick up uh, faces up to about a 30 degree turning of the head, but they're just not appropriate for using as people are moving around in their real world environment. But if, the, if they're in a lab uh, situation, it's, uh, it's a very good, very precise measure of stress. It's, it's objective, it's unobtrusive, um, and it's, it's a very good way to measure stress with uh, computer tasks. And I, I will mention that when we use, in the wild, when we use all these different uh, methods, uh, we, we do synchronize them to the second so that at different points of time, we have a fairly good picture of what people are doing and what their stress is, what their mood is. So uh, let me talk about a study we did with the thermal imaging camera. Uh, we, we did have 63 people come into a laboratory to work on a task um, and we had two conditions. Now, 
we wanted to test whether um, people, if they received an email in what's called a batch, which means you get a set of emails, you deal with them, and then you do a task, as opposed to if people are continually interrupted by emails. Now, in the workplace, people report that their most common source of interruption is email, and that's why we chose uh, that's why we chose email. So we also had other conditions where we introduced an anticipatory stressor because we thought this would model well what goes on in the real world if people, let's say they have a deadline uh, that they have to deal with, you, you would have high anticipatory stress, you know, as opposed to other times, you know, sometimes it's high season, sometimes it's low season. And so, uh, this is the experimental design. And uh, here's what we found. Um, so we had these two conditions. Uh, so on the, the left graph here, we see that if people are continually interrupted, and this was a significant interaction, that as stress goes up, the time spent on email goes up as well. And this makes perfect sense, right? Because we also know from many past studies that the more time you spend on email, uh, the more stressed you are. So this is with continual interruptions. So the more interruptions, and of course, the longer time it takes, the more you're interrupted. But when you're bashed, when you have emails all at once, you know, you deal with that as, as, a, as its own task, and then you move on and you do another task. We gave people an essay to work on. We find the opposite effect. We find that as time in email goes down, stress goes up. So there's, there's something about um, the batching that makes people work faster and become more stressed. And you know the best interpretation we can give is that you know you see a whole slew of emails, and you just you know it it's it represents stress, right? E email is a source of stress. It represents stress because it represents work that you have to do, and when you see them all at once, it just adds to stress. Uh, we also find a relationship with with mood, and this is anger as measured by the thermal imaging camera, that as stress goes down, uh, anger goes up when email is batched, which is a, a, a curious uh, finding. The continual makes perfect sense for us, right? If you're continually interrupted, you're getting more and more angry and more and more stressed, but it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, hard for us to interpret why we find uh, this other, you know, why, why would people be less angry and more stressed when email is batched? I don't know, perhaps, uh, perhaps this says something about, um, may, maybe this is an argument for, um, for batching email. Now, what we did, was we uh, videotaped people's faces and we applied um, using neural networks and using an emotion recognition program, we were able to look at what people's uh, emotional display was on their faces as they were dealing with interruptions uh, versus not. Now, um, you know, looking at emotional display in the face, it's important in a workplace because, you know, there's the saying, we wear our emotions on our sleeves. And, you know, you have one person in your office who has this sour, is just in a sour mood, you know, you, you stay away from that person. And, and there's a lot of research that shows there are contagion effects with emotion. So, so uh, there's a lot of reasons to be interested for why you might want to look at the display of emotion. And what I find interesting here is that, yes, when people, uh, the times when they were handling interruptions, 
So you can see at the images on the right side, uh, one person, uh, the top person on the right has uh, an angry expression versus when she's working on the regular task, uh, she's more neutral. And the same with the person on the bottom, on the right side tends to show uh, more of an angry expression. These are just two um, that we picked out, but um, this is reported in a, a archive paper. So uh, when are people focused? Uh, so this was a study done um, with 32 people who were tracked over five uh, full work days. They were given um, experience sampling probes 18 times a day, which, which is quite a lot. Um, I, I believe some of you may have seen this already, so this won't be new to you. But what we did was um, we asked people in these experience sampling probes two questions. At the, at the um, moment, what you're doing right now, how engaged are you and how challenged are you? But let me start by just giving a general overview of what we found. Uh, we find that people uh, do check email uh, quite a lot, about averaging 74 times a day. This was replicated a year later where we found that people checked it 77 times a day. They switched their screens on average 566 times a day. Uh, and they engage in uh, the the face to face interaction. This is a little bit uh, misleading here. It's not eighty seven different kind different face to face interactions per day, but at the time that the sense cam took pictures, people were in face to face interactions, and the sense cam samples uh, interaction about once every fifteen seconds. So 86 of those time sampled people were in face-to-face -face interactions. So as I mentioned in the experience sampling, people were given two questions, how engaged were you? How challenged were you? And we developed a framework that we map this onto where when people are highly engaged and highly challenged, we say they're in a state of focus highly engaged, not at all challenged. We call this rote, you know, just being, it's like playing solitaire. You're very engaged, but it's not challenging. You're not challenged, not engaged. We call it bored. You're highly challenged and not engaged. We call it frustrated. And we find that there do seem to be rhythms of focused attention over the workday with peaks in mid-morning and mid-afternoon. So what we find is that people have, they seem to show rhythms of focus. Now, this could coincide with people's attentional resources uh, because we know that, you know, after lunch, during lunch, people have a chance to replenish and then they come back and they slowly ramp up into focus. They don't start their day focused. We also find um, because that people are happiest when they're doing this kind of work that's highly engaging, but not challenged at all, right? What we call road work. And in these experience sampling probes, we also uh, asked questions about mood using, if you're familiar with Russell's circumplex model of mood, we, we use that. So uh, when people are focused though, being focused is associated with high stress. Why? Because you have to use a lot of attentional resources when you're, when you're in sustained focus, right? And using up resources is, uh, can also be associated with stress. Now, some of you might say, well, maybe people might be in flow. Well, it turns out that flow, flow is a myth in the workplace. Uh, if you are an artist or a dancer or a woodworker or a computer gamer, you might get into flow. But in day-to-day -day information kinds of work, people rarely get into flow. You know, we've, we've rarely seen it. 
And even in, in real life, uh, Sheikh Samahali, who wrote the book on flow, found that uh, roughly about 40% of people don't, don't get into a flow state. So it's, it's ideal, right? It's something we all want to strive for, but it's pretty rare that, that it happens. Uh, we <clears throat> also found that uh, if people are doing boring work or road work, we also find they're more likely to be interrupted and to spend longer amounts of time in interruption. So this suggests to us that being in a bored or attentional road state uh, might make people more susceptible to interruptions. So <clears throat> in another study, we were determined to see if we can get people to extend their focus duration. And you, one way to do that is to simply block people's distractions. So this is a study where we had uh, 32 information workers. We tracked them for five days at working as they normally would. And we gave them five days where their online distractions were blocked. We used a blocking software called Freedom. Now, you know, there's, there's a lot of different software out there that is designed to help people extend their focus. Um, and they fall in two different classes. And one class is uh, where it makes people more aware of how much time they're spending on, on, uh, on what they're doing. Uh, and the other class is where you just, you know, cold turkey block distractions. And it's the second class of software that we used. So we used, uh, this uh, is a cog the cognitive absorption scale. So this is getting people's subjective in, uh, perceptions of how well the software worked. And the cognitive absorption scale has five different dimensions. And after the second week, after people's distractions were blocked for a week, we found that focused immersion, this is a dimension on the scale, significantly increased. That means they, they perceived themselves as being more focused. Their temporal dissociation, which means um, you're, you're not aware of the passage of time, that actually decreased. And you know, we thought about it and we thought, well, maybe it's because we took people's social media away. Right, people are often distracted by social media, and when you get involved in a rabbit hole of social media, you get temporally dissociated. And so we took that away from people. So we made people even more aware of the passage of time. But what really baffled us was that there was no difference in control, and that made absolutely no sense to us. We thought people should feel that they have more control of their attention. And their enjoyment decreased, and I imagine it's because we took away their rote activity, right? the rote activity of, of software. <clears throat> but it made a lot more sense to us when we discovered that our sample actually fell into two very distinct groups as measured by the conscientiousness dimension of the big five and by their impulsivity as mentioned on the UPPS impulsivity scale. We found that there were people who fell into a group of having low self-control and high self-control. And interestingly, people with the low self-control group, you know, they did feel more in self, having more control after distractions were blocked. People in the high self-control though, actually felt uh, less in control, which is really quite interesting, but I'll explain why this might be the case. Uh, we measured their workload using the NASA TLX workload scale. This is a subjective measure of cognitive load. 
and we find uh, the so low self control group, um, there was really no difference in assessed workload, but in the high self control group, people actually felt they had a greater workload when their distractions were blocked. And let me just pause here and see if anyone can guess why that might be the case. Remember, people in the high self-control group score high in conscientiousness and low in impulsivity. Anyone want to try to take a guess? Is it that um, focused work is more demanding than switching to email and there's just doing sustained focused work all the time? Yes, you're very, very close. It's because if, if, you're, if you're a person who's very conscientious, right? You're, gonna, you're a workaholic, you're gonna work straight through. Ordinarily, these people would take online breaks and have, they were able to get right back on track. But if you're not able to take uh, online breaks because we took that away from them, they actually worked straight through. And one person even missed her commuter shuttle back. She worked straight through, it was seven o'clock at night. She missed the last compute, commuter shuttle. So people who, who already have high self-control have this ability to be able to go into rote work and come right back without uh, falling into, um, into the rabbit hole. So um, there's lots of reasons why we interrupt. And <clears throat> there is a popular myth that says the reason why we can't pay attention is because people don't have uh, willpower. No, let's do something to increase people's willpower. Uh, or the other popular myth is that we are interrupted and switch our attention because of targeted notifications, the algorithms, you know, which of course they can uh, model our deepest personality and know how to get to our very core to interrupt us. That's, that, that's true, but these are not the only reasons. There's a lot of other reasons, a host of reasons why people interrupt. And these are attributable to individual reasons, uh, environmental reasons, uh, social reasons. We, we are social beings. We, our digital world is social. People want to maintain social capital. People uh, are concerned about power. There's all kinds of power relations going on, which is why people feel compelled to check email. Uh, and so, uh, and there are other social factors as well. And of course there are techn technological factors like the um, uh, targeted notifications. And just to give you a sense of what these individual differences might be, uh, we did do a factor analysis in one of our studies and we found that there was one factor that explained quite a lot of variance of people's short attention span, this factor uh, explained uh, the most. And we use the label of lack of control. And this is people who score higher on the big five personality trait of neuroticism. They're also higher who score in a personality trait called impulsivity or urgency, and they're more susceptible to stress. So these are people who, when we measure their stress uh, using uh, monitors and wearables, they're more susceptible to stress. So uh, we also, uh, and this is something that I want to propose uh, as, as a hypothesis, that um, it's the very design of the internet itself affects our uh, susceptibility to interruptions. Because as, as you know, the internet was designed by Vannevar Bush to map onto what he believed was the structure of human memory. Uh, this is uh, a model by John Anderson of a theoretical structure of semantic memory. 
And the internet does mirror in many ways our semantic memory, because if you're on something like Wikipedia and you, you read something and you'll see a link, right? The context of what you're reading primes you to be thinking about that topic. And there's this link, you click on it, you go to a new page, you're reading new content, you're getting new priming, you see other links that are highlighted. And you know it enables you to go on a joy ride through the internet. So this is a hypothesis that I propose. Okay, uh, I do want to give lots of credit to my great collaborators uh, over the years and would like to uh, say thanks to all of you for inviting me. Um, I do have a book, which is on what I talked about today and, and a lot more. It's going to be published by Harper Collins. And in the UK, it's going to be published by the sister publisher, William Collins. Uh, and this is a, um, it, it's a, a science book for the general reader. So, um, I hope you'll might be interested and you can always uh, reach me. So I'm going to stop the share and if anyone has any questions or discussion would love to talk. <laughs>